Hello brothers and sisters. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I greet you all in the precious name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm a bit late today, but I want to make a quick recording to help recalibrate us and bring us back to where I believe Jesus wants all of us to be a sound to be. That's in a sound footing. He doesn't want us to remain babies at all times. He doesn't want us to um, get our nourishment from men alone. Yes, as babies you get fed by somebody else. But as you mature, it's expected that you go and get your own food to eat. Now, um, basically I'm, I'm trying to enjoin us to hit the books, study, study, study. Yes, I know a couple of us might be from time to time expecting and waiting for messages to come out. And they're nice and good messages that God um, sends to us through people. They're nice and good. But the expectation is that even after you've heard those messages, you should go back, check the scripture for context, to first and foremost to ensure that what they said is actually what scripture says. And then what is meant when they said what they said, even if it comes from scripture, is actually what it means. Um, you should always check for context. Praise God. I will use uh, this short seg uh, segment today to go through a couple of scriptures, a few scriptures that come to mind, which uh, many of us, particularly in the body of Christ, we stretch and take out of context and make a doctrine out of if uh, God actually quickens that scripture to you personally in terms of uh, meaning for you nice and good but the meaning for you doesn't mean that it is doctrinal for the rest of the body of Christ I give you an instance um, several years ago when I asked God for direction concerning um, when I was about traveling out of my native country, I asked him about um, the, the airline one was to travel with. And the scripture that he brought, that quick, uh, he quickened to me was, a virgin shall bring forth a son. And for me at that point in time, it was a virgin that, that jumped out. So it when I ultimately checked it, it was only Virgin Atlantic that was the airline that was flying to the country that I was about um, going to. So that was a word for me. Now, having said that, that word is in the scripture. Does it mean every time one wants to travel, I, I, or somebody asks me what uh, flight to use, I come back and tell him that this was the scripture God gave me. So... It's Virgin Atlantic you should travel with. No, that's wrong. I enjoin you to go back and check. I'll give you another instance. A dear, dear brother of mine, uh, several years ago, we, we were praying about direction for him. He, he, had, um, he needed to know from God where his accommodation was going to be. There was a lot of pressure with respect to where he was living and he needed to hear from God concerning where he was to move to. And the Lord quickened the scripture to him about uh, a ravenous bed. And when we went back, we studied what was a ravenous bed, a scripture concerning a ravenous bed from the east. Of course, that scripture was, in context, was talking about Cyrus, King Cyrus. But it used a particular phraseology, a ravenous bed from the east. And in context, we found that the ravenous bed meant, and it was a bed of prey. And actually, it was translated from the word an eagle. And by extension, amongst the places he was looking for, that name, eagle, was very relevant. So... It narrowed everything down to 
a place called Eagle Island. And of course, once he went there, the accommodation was right there for him. Now, would he take? Would we take that to mean that any time we um, have an issue and we're praying to God, that the place to go to would be somewhere that has ego? No. I hope I've explained a little bit about that. But now, follow me. Let's go into Scripture. We'll go to the book of uh, Acts, chapter seventeen, and read from verse ten. And I read, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. The Bible says the Berean Christians were more noble than the Thessalonicans. That yes, they received what was being preached readily with a readiness of mind. But yes, after receiving it, at the end of the day, they went back to search the scriptures to see whether those things that they were told were actually so. That is sound doctrine. Whatever is taught, go back. Whatever is said to you, go back and check to make sure that it is actually so. Receive it. Don't fight the fellow. Take it. Go back and check. If it is in line with what scripture says, gladly run with it. If it's not in line, just gladly eat the hay and drop the sticks. Praise God. Um, another scripture, that we'll, one of the uh, few scriptures we want to talk about that we usually uh, get into. Uh, we have it in... Uh, um, the Psalms, and it's also in the uh, First Chronicles chapter 16. Let's see if I can find it. From verse 18. First Chronicles 16, 18. Saying unto thee, will I, unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when you were but few, even a few and strangers in it. And when they went into the, from went from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another kingdom, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, "Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm." I'm sure you must have heard this over and over and over and over again. Now notice that in context, um, this was talking about the children of Israel. How God protected them whilst they went from nation to nation, whilst they were going into the promised land. He was talking about them as a whole. And he said, he suffered not kings to do them any harm. He says, and when they went from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, is saying to those to men and to kings, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Who is anointed of God? Of God. Unfortunately, we've taken it out of context and looked at it that the only the anointed of God here that is being spoken of because he mentioned prophets are those that are in ministry. No. No, don't be don't don't be uh, don't shortchange yourself. He spoke about the whole nation of Israel there. All those that were anointed of God. In this, this, in this dispensation of grace, who are the anointed ones of God? They are Christians. That's what the word Christ means. The anointed one and his anointing. Christian, a Christian, one who is born again, is actually anointed. So in essence, he is saying here, this scripture says that he suffers no man to do Christians wrong. Yea, he reproves kings for their sakes, saying to those men and to those kings, Touch not my Christians, and do my prophets no harm. Yes, prophets and men of God are all inclusive or uh, included in this umbrella. They are part of those that are not to be touched, that others have been given not for them not to be touched. Yes. 
but it also includes every Christian. So Christians should not look at it and say, um, if a man of God errs or misbehaves, that he is not accountable. No, that's not what that scripture is saying. The scripture is saying that he, God has given orders that no harm should be done to a Christian. A scriptural. So it's not the the um, exclusive right of only men of God, so to speak. If you're a Christian, you're a man of God or a woman of God. And it, it is all encompassing. Praise God. Except you're subtracting yourself from being one of the anointed ones. It is not the exclusive right of only those who are in ministry. It is the exclusive right of all those who are, anoint, who are anointed of God. And those ones are Christians. Praise God. Another one. Um, let's see if we could get there quickly. Is in the book of uh, First Timothy. Chapter 2. From verse 1. I read. I exhort therefore that first of all. Supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Stop there. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. There's a semicolon there. Now he's defining, making a subset of who does all men include? For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of truth. Praise God. You notice that, that is, the first thing he talks about is that we should pray for all men. And included inside this all men are kings and for those who are in authority. And the simple reason be behind that is that if, all, if you've prayed for all men, inclusive of kings and those who are in authority, there will be peace in the land. That is what God wants. You pray for everybody because he wants all men to be saved. So it is not the exclusive of just kings and those who are in authority. That we should be praying for. That's not what that scripture is saying. The scripture yes highlights kings. And those who, should, who are in authority. But it says first of all. For all men. That means. And that word men. There is the, the Greek word anthropos. Which means men and women. So in essence. He's, he's saying that he wants us to. Pray with all manner of prayers. For every human being. Inclusive of kings. And those who are in authority. That's God's will. That's what he wants us to do. Don't look at it that, oh, I haven't prayed for kings today. I haven't prayed for those that are in authority, so I have disobeyed. He's telling us that he wants us to have a habitual way of praying that includes prayer for all people. Because God wants them saved. Praise God. It's not that... It's just kings and those who are in authority. No. Everybody, your neighbor. And that doesn't mean, it's not an ironclad rule that says that before you pray for yourself, first of all, you must pray for the next person. That's not what he's enjoining us to do. It's just he's reminding you that it is our responsibility to pray for everybody. And the, the ultimate aim and goal there is for them to receive Christ. That's what God put us here for. Praise God. There are other scriptures like that. But all I have said so far is to enjoin us to get back into the books and study for ourselves. Don't just take cord that has been chewed by somebody and given to us to eat. You might not know what has been inside that cord. Go and chew the, the, raw, the fresh hay for yourself and make it cord for yourself and digest it for yourself. That way nobody can take it from you. It is yours and yours forever. But if you're going and walking based on the interpretation of another man, 
You never know if his interpretation is correct. Go between yourself, the Word and the Spirit of God. And hear for yourself. And you will live because you will be getting it fresh from the source. Praise God. Hallelujah.